Hey everybody, it's me, and there's a topic that's been on my mind for quite a while that I really want to discuss with you guys. And for those of you who watch my YouTube channel, you may have seen me talk about being feminine as a trans man in a previous video from last month. And that was me sort of feel like figuring out how I wanted to go about talking about this thing that has happened in my life. Um, and to be honest, I'm still not exactly sure if I have the words, but I was on TikTok and there was this video that came up by somebody named Devin who talked about how transitioning allowed them to reconnect with their femininity. My top surgery saved my life and it helped me reconnect back with my womanhood and femininity. That is how I feel about my transition. And so I just wanted to sort of talk about that and kind of, I don't know, share that with you guys, I guess, because if I'm feeling this way and I've come across now another person who's feeling this way, I think that there are probably other people out there who also feel this way and we might as well talk about it. So the first thing that I want to do is talk about my story for those of you who don't know. Um, I was assigned female at birth. However, biologically, as I've developed um, my, through my secondary sex characteristics, I ended up having like quite a few differences. Um, so for example, in my chest, uh, my left breast actually did not have a bud, so that developmentally was different. By the time I was in my 20s, I had stage four endometriosis, as well as polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, which all led to some other significant like issues in my body. The second thing is that I always felt wrong in my body growing up. I should rephrase that. I always felt wrong socially growing up. Um, in terms of how I was categorized as a girl. Yes, I did like some feminine things. I was interested in becoming a teacher and the concept of having a big family, which I guess are like traditionally feminine characteristics. Um, but I also was very sporty. I liked to play basketball. I liked to hang out with the boys. Not to say that those are indicators of gender, like internal gender, but my social expression of my gender definitely didn't line up with traditional femininity. And by the time I hit puberty, I knew that something was wrong. I denied the fact that I was growing breasts. I was like not really understanding that puberty meant not that I would get a deeper voice and grow facial hair, but actually that I would get a period and have to go through all of those other changes that are just like, what? So puberty was a huge letdown for me. And also at that time, I stopped playing basketball because I was required to play on the girls' team and I didn't feel like that was the space for me. I felt like I was invading women's spaces. I felt like I, I was not a girl, therefore I should not be on the girls' team. As a, as a high schooler in the NJROTC program at my high school, I was devastated to learn two things. First off, that the uniforms are actually not unisex, so I was being required at least once a week to wear skirts during spring and summer uh, and some of fall. And uh, two, that the teams again were divided by sex, which meant that I could not join the armed drill team, which I don't know now, but at the time was males only. And I also had the misconception that I would get to be called sir, but actually I was called ma'am and miss, which just was not awesome. By that point in my life, um, I had cut my hair super short and was dealing with the consequences of that. People saying that uh, they thought I was a lesbian, people saying that I should grow my hair out and become more you know, feminine, try to attract a boy. Um, eventually that did happen. I grew out my hair. I started wearing like a lot more clothing like this because that's what I was encouraged to do by my peers. That's what I did. Um, and by the time I hit adulthood, it was just, it, my life internally and externally was an absolute mess. It wasn't until a year after I graduated high school in 2014, when I learned the term gender fluid and I learned the term transgender. You guys have probably heard me tell the story a million times, but hearing the definition of transgender, I immediately was like, ah, shit. Like, that's, that's, that's me. That is what is going on in here. And I had a crisis about it. I didn't talk about it uh, with anybody except like super close friends. Um, the person who told me uh, about the terms. Um, 
and that person's parents were the first people who I talked to about it. Uh, then my brother, um, and then my dad, and then my mom, and then everybody. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll be posting a video about my Facebook post where I came out, uh, and how messy that was, but, uh, suffice to say that while I did receive a lot of support, I also received a lot of, like, uh, apprehension and fear from uh, people who I had been close to in my life and that also changed my you know my existence that changed the way that I interacted with people um, but it did give me the confidence to start trying to assert my masculinity and this is this is an interesting thing that happens to a lot of people and um, I'm one of them where because my physical body did not fit what was correct um, I had to compensate for that until I was able to access gender affirming care. It started with a social transition and the social transition involved me wearing a lot of cargo shorts and ball caps and very baggy men's clothing, which was not far from how I dressed as a middle schooler, um, and an elementary school kid, but especially as a middle schooler when I was like really entering puberty and the first couple of years of high school it was very similar to how I dressed at those times anyway but it was with the added stressor of really trying to get people to understand that I am a guy and that had to happen because I couldn't access gender affirming care but I didn't know that until much later and my dysphoria was centered around my body I had breasts I had, well, really, that was the main thing. But also, my internal organs, my uterus, my ovaries, as well as my primary sex characteristics, which, you know, that's not something I can really talk about on here. But um, the only thing, that the only factor that I had control over at the time was my clothing. And really basically begging people to use the right pronouns um, because being in my own skin was already so dysphoric. It was already so dysphoria inducing and, and already so bad that being reminded of those things um, by another person's terminology would cause just a ridiculous spiral. It was, it was terrible. So I, in 2014, realized I was trans like, had words for it, like, learned the vocabulary for it, I wasn't able to start my medical transition until 2019. When I came out in 2017, I did, I started my social transition. And for some people, socially transitioning is enough. For other people, like, further steps need to be taken, and that can be in the form of hormone replacement therapy, gender affirming surgeries, um, haircuts, it, it can be like all sorts of different things. Um, and every person is different. For me, starting on testosterone was the first thing that like, oh my goodness, hey, I don't feel so terrible anymore. Actually, for me, in 2018, starting on Lupron Depot, which was a, which is a estrogen blocking medication for medical reasons ended up already starting that huge sense of relief because the first thing that happened was oh my goodness my period stopped holy cow and obviously there was a lot tied up in that my period was a source of great physical pain um, and it was lasting longer and longer and longer to where I was basically bleeding most of the month and I was just, you know, stage four endometriosis is no joke. Um, I was in significant pain pretty much 24 seven. As soon as the estrogen got like stopped, that immediately started to decrease. So that stressor started to decrease. And then I got to live my life as an almost normal person. I was still dysphoric, I was still struggling with things, but that was one less thing that was causing stress for me. So hormone blockers, who knew? Then in 2019, I actually got to start hormone replacement therapy where I went on testosterone. And 
that added just another layer of, hey, this isn't so bad. Like living life, it's not so terrible. My voice started to drop. I started to um, have the masculinizing effects of body hair and um, physical like shape kind of changing a little bit. Not like a lot, but enough that it was like, hmm, this is something. And I found that I didn't have to try so hard to pass. I could step out of my house and who knew? Like people weren't misgendering me and I wasn't being reminded of how dysphoric it was to be in my own skin. Then I had a hysterectomy and that was because it was medically necessary, but it turned out to be one of the best choices I could have made as a human being for my transition um, for so many reasons. That also took another weight off of me and that was a year after starting tea. So then I was like, wow, like this is doing really good. And all of a sudden my dysphoria got really intense, really, really, really intense. And it had to do with what used to be here. So I'll show you my scars only because I'm sure they'll censor me if it's anything else. So those are my scars. Having top surgery became my number one priority, point blank. That was the only thing I could think about because almost everything else was matching my internal identity, there were a few things that weren't, and these were two of them. And it was really, really bad because these were like first, like they're the first thing that people see when they see you, right? I was still binding, but like as it went on, I got more and more dysphoric about having to bind, about having to do this every day, sleeping in my binder, refusing to take it off unsafe, unsafe practices with my binder. I had top surgery scheduled. It got canceled due to the pandemic. That was a huge blow to me as a person. Like, oh my goodness, absolutely awful. Just, it was, it felt life ending. Then finally, top surgery. And it's been almost two years since top surgery. I had top surgery in November of 2021. And some miraculous thing has happened. Just this absolutely wonderful, miraculous thing, which is that, as you can see, I am now comfortable wearing whatever the fuck I want. What? What? <laughs> if you had told 2017 me that I would be on video publicly or even stepping out of my house in this outfit i would not believe you i wouldn't i would be like ha huh, <laughs> there's a million things i would rather do than that why did my gender identity change no you know what changed how comfortable i am in my own skin so now I am actually finding myself reconnecting with femininity and actually wanting to honor my experience as a person who was assigned female at birth and who then was socialized female. Like these are things that like I value significantly, whereas before I just wanted to forget it because it reminded me of the dysphoria of living in my own skin. So now I can step out of my house looking like this. And you know, I can get misgendered. And guess what? I don't spiral. I laugh, I make a joke out of it. I am more than just a trans guy. I am more than just a guy. I am so many more things and you know what's crazy is that there are people out there who will you know hear that you're you're trans and they will say you're so much more than that you shouldn't make that your whole identity and the problem with that concept and that rhetoric is that until a person is comfortable in their own skin the thing that is making them so severely dysphoric is gonna be first and foremost it's gonna be the only thing they can see it is this overwhelming terrible feeling 
it is, it is crippling. I could not engage with any other aspects of who I was because this thing was so big and so heavy and took up so much space in my heart, in my mind, in my life, in my soul. I couldn't be any of the other awesome things that I am. I couldn't focus on my creativity, on my relationships, on my femininity, on things other than me. I couldn't focus on the state of the world, of the nation, of my neighborhood. I couldn't, I couldn't think about any of that stuff because I was so overwhelmed with dysphoria. And the fix was not pushing it down. It was not pretending to be somebody I'm not. It was allowing myself to transition, allowing myself to have residence in the body that is correct. And there are still things that I wish were different and that I plan to change and I plan to fix. But for right now, where I'm at, holy shit, this is more free than I've ever been. So much so that I'm updating my pronouns. And this is me doing it right now. My pronouns are he, z, they, it, and sometimes she. And you may be thinking, what? What is this insanity? There are certain contexts, especially as a gay man, where she and her are used. And that's great. Call me a queen. Guess what? It doesn't make me dysphoric anymore and I'm not scared about it. I'm just happy and content. I know who I am and who you think I am does not matter to me because I'm in the right body or as close to it as I can get for right now. So am I transmasculine? Yes. But I'm also so many other things. I am flamboyant. I am pretty. I am strong. I am smart. I am creative. I am a parent. I am a spouse. I am a boyfriend. I am non-binary, agender. I exist so far outside of the confines of gender that it doesn't matter to me anymore. And that is so freeing. Holy shit. But I wouldn't have gotten here without my transition. Without my transition, I wouldn't even be here, period. And that is why I wanted to make this video. Because there are so many people right now who are losing access to their gender-affirming care. So many people who could live a life where they are not constantly struggling to even think about getting out of bed, who, who are not able to access the care that they need in order to make it another year, another five years, another 10 years, another month. There are laws right now that have been proposed and some that have passed, Florida looking at you, to where people literally cannot access life-saving medicine. And guess what? It is not just trans people who are being impacted here. And among all of these groups, children. You have children who are experiencing precocious puberty who are going through puberty at six years old, who cannot access hormone blockers to stop that from happening. You have children who are intersex, who have no say on what puberty they get to go through, and who may need hormones or hormone blockers to save their life. Like from a medical standpoint, we're not even talking about mental health, which is also medical health, but okay. And you have trans people. You have trans people, children, teens, who all they need, all they need until they hit 15, 16 years old is a hormone blocker. That's it. And that is all they would be prescribed. There are so few surgeries that happen to children, gender affirming surgeries that happen to children. So few. And Hormones are not prescribed to children. Hormone blockers are. 
I'm watching my own kid go through this experience where they came out to their biological parents at a very young age. You know what the process was after that? Nothing for a while because this kid is not experiencing puberty yet. Let them wear the clothes they want to wear. Let them have the haircut they want to have. Let them use the name and pronouns they want to use. And then when they reached puberty and they said, oh my God, this is very incorrect. Okay, here's some hormone blockers. Have some time to think about it. Oh, and by the way, they've had therapists, plural, an entire team of therapists the whole time. It's not the split second decision that is made for these children. It's not forcing anything on them, except for therapy. <laughs> and even then, you can't really force therapy on a person. You can say, go see a therapist. And what they do in there with that therapist is, is up to them. But, like, here we are in states where it's not just children and their parents who are being regulated by the state. It is adults who have been on gender-affirming care, hormone replacement therapy, or scheduled for surgeries, what have you, for a very long time, who are now finding that they cannot access this medication, these treatments that allow them to be alive in their own skin. And that just is so frustrating. That is so sad. And it's hard not to just sit here and lament about it. I have to believe that there is something we can do to fix this. The first thing is voting. Period. Voting. Not just on a state level, but on a local level. In terms of who is on your school board, your local governor, all of these things, you have a say in and you need, you have a responsibility to use that voice to help people who have less of a voice than you do, first and foremost. Secondly is, people are fleeing right now, and there are people who cannot afford to leave. And if you know somebody who is in that situation where they are trying to leave and they cannot, do what you can to help them. Even if that means they have to stay there, do what you can to help them while they are staying in that situation. If you have the means and the ability, do it. There is a nonprofit called A Place for Marsha that is helping people leave those states and go to places where they actually will have access to gender affirming care. You can sign up for it. I'll put a link in the description. You can sign up either to help people leave you can sign up to be a, a host, short-term or long-term, for people who have left and have nowhere to stay. Um, and you can also donate money. And if that's not an option for you, you can also reach out to people who you know are in those situations. You can find them all over TikTok. You can find them all over Instagram, YouTube. Find the people who are in those situations and offer to help them in whatever way you can because it's getting scary for people right now. And there are a lot of trans people who are not gonna be able in those situations to live, to live a life in their own skin, to live a life where they're happy, content, comfortable, okay with stepping out the door and not having to worry about, not only am I gonna get misgendered, but am I gonna be assaulted? Am I going to be arrested? Anyway. That's the video. To my trans siblings, I'm sorry that this is happening. We have to be strong and please hold on, there is hope. We're gonna get through this.